Welcome to the final episode of Series 34 and the final episode of 2020, everyone. We welcome back Nick Butler to discuss the modular world building game Tidebreaker. But before we get to that, we have some announcements. Uh, first up, uh, I'm the only one here because it's pretty late on a Sunday. Uh, and I did not want to bother Amelia, but I wanted to thank everyone uh, who contributed to the World Builders fundraiser. Uh, together, we were able to unlock quite a few fantastic bonuses for the network, uh, which I am very, very thrilled to hear uh, on both campaign uh, Skyjacks and Skyjacks Couriers Call uh, with some wonderful guest spots by Patrick Rothfuss. Next up... I also wanted to thank everyone who tuned in to my A Tale of Twinkle and Awe stream this last Friday, where we're playing a campaign using the game that I'm working on with Am Amaraz Chimera. Um, if you didn't tune in, uh, you missed out on some fantastic Citrusmas festivities uh, before a very surprise ending. For now, we've got a two week break and we'll be streaming again every other Friday starting January 8th, 2021. You can tune in at 7.30 p.m. Central Time that Friday at twitch.chimera.games, or you can catch up on the previous streams at the same location or on YouTube at youtube.chimera.games. And I think that's all that we have for announcements for today's episode. Stick around after the show for the call to action and some outtakes as usual, as uh, as is tradition on the third episode of the series. Um, and until then, let's get on with the show. Enjoy. Welcome back to our discussion episode. Last time we created characters for Tiebreaker. This episode we will be discussing the character creation process. We are very thrilled to welcome back Nick Butler, designer of this game. Uh, do you want to reintroduce yourself again for everyone at home and uh, tell us a little bit about the character you made last episode, Nick? What's good, everybody? It's your boy. I'm back. Uh, <laughs> uh, just, you had some lemonade. Yeah. You're doing great. <laughs> had some lemonade, some reheated Dominoes. Oh, yeah. Oh, Life is good. Dream. I was eating some leftover Limited dream, baby. Olive Garden breadsticks earlier. It was pretty oh, great. There you go. Oh, <laughs> uh, man. Like, that's the everything and the kitchen sink, huh? Yep. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, so my character is Niet. I based him off of Tien from Dragon Ball Z. Um, you know, we got the the whole Dragon Ball Z, Z staples for get the key blasting, the mirror image techniques, and the punching rocks and making them explode when your best friend dies because they self destructed on some Saiyan's back. Mm. Like you know, like we got it. We got all, all the bells and whistles and, and three abilities. Oh, wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Ryan, tell us about the character you made. Uh, so I made uh, Crimson Stainer, uh, a magical girl, uh, elemental magic infused martial artist uh, who's also kind of a, a brainy person um, in her day job. Um, and uh, she's able to transform, uh, which really like ups her power level for a little bit. Uh, she does some fire punching to, to really uh, deal some damage. And then... Uh, kind of throws off the opponents with some stuns and, and exhaustion uh, from her lightning kicks. Uh, so, uh, yeah, she's pretty she's pretty sweet. That's a really good combo, too. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Transform, you're exhausted. Okay, hit me. Yep. <laughs> oh, you can't? <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> I love it. Yeah, absolutely. 
Um, and Amelia, how about your character? Um, well, to get back at Ryan for making another magical girl, uh, I made <laughs> another character um, who fights with a katana, quick and dirty, get in, get out. Um, I started with the concept of having somebody who, like, previously was a champion sort of fell out of favor, and now we're on our way back up to the top. Um, but most of my abilities revolve around um, getting in quickly, beating people in initiative, dealing damage, being gone before they can do anything to me. Um, That's awesome. Oh, I, I did name them Falcon Swift. I love it. Falcon Swift. Falcon Swift, which I don't know if it's as good as Luminance Edge, but yep. it's up there. <laughs> it's pretty good. <laughs> it's pretty good. <laughs> I agree. All right. Uh, well, let's go ahead and dive right into a segment that we are calling D20 for your thoughts. D20 for your thoughts. In this segment, we talk to our guests about their thoughts on the character creation process, how it relates to the system and to other games. Yeah, but first, we'd like to get to know our guests a little better before we begin. Um, can you tell us uh, how you got into RPGs in the first place, Nick? Well, I mean, I've been playing this for a minute, uh, RPGs and stuff. I uh, bought second edition, starter edition mm. for, for Dungeons and Dragons and GM for my brother and sister one time. They ended up like killing the wyvern with a landslide, which was a... Uh, which was pretty cool. Oh, nice. Uh, they weren't supposed to survive that fight, if I recall how that uh, <laughs> module works out. Like, you're not supposed to fight the Wyvern directly. Because it's like a, I think it was like a CR5, and they were like CR1, yeah. like level one characters in that starter thing. But they were like, yeah, you know, how, how about rocks fall and the bad guys die? <laughs> <laughs> they got that right on the first first session. Yeah. Yeah, so it's like instead of rocks while everybody dies, it was just just those that opposed them. Nice. So I was like, yeah. Again, shout out to my brother and sister. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we're very very family friendly game here. Okay. Yeah, that's very cool. <laughs> family focused. All right. Uh, yeah, but beyond that, like I ended up not playing D and D for a while after that, and um, I found a game called Thrash by Aaron Cluey. Clooney, uh, he made Thrash. Uh, Thrash was uh, really cool because it was like an anime RPG, and it was based off of uh, Mechton Z, uh, Mike Pondsmith and its stuff, right, from Cyber Cyberpunk or whatever. Mm. And it had a similar, like, what I like to call a la carte system, where you pair up your modifiers and whatnot, and you make special attacks, like, based off of that. Okay. Where Tiebreaker kind of, like, took that and made it more of, like, a general approach kind of thing with our three abilities. Because our abilities are supposed to represent anything. Where in Frash, it was specifically like, this is your Hadouken, this is your Dragon Punch. Okay. And it does just the Dragon Punch. It's rising, it has flame on it. So you rise up and you set people on fire and they fall over. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, whereas you've uh, experienced from the last episode, Tidebreaker kind of takes that um, and does it a little bit differently. But yeah, so Thrash was like kind of like my eye opener because I was like, wow one dude did that right yeah like this like 160 page document i think it was or something like that with like all of these endless possibilities and they're it's not a class-based system or anything and so like teenage me like basically dug through that book and i was just building stuff for years mm. like long after he abandoned the project right um and like, but I fell in love with it because yeah. to me, that game is a cult classic. Uh, <laughs> if the cult might just be me, but like, like I think it's, it's very small. I think cult. it's amazing. <laughs> well, yeah, like I had some fond memories of some, a couple of guys from college that we, we played it. Uh, one of the more interesting characters uh, was this guy that we made that he fought with a, a giant monster truck tire attached to a chain. Oh, boy. <laughs> And that was the stuff that we were doing in Thrash, right? And yeah. I wanted to kind of like uh, bring that over to more like modernized kind of um, stuff, right? Yeah. Because Thrash was like extremely country. It was like a lot of math, like different die sizes and things. And like like mechanically, it's kind of a mess with the numbers. But uh, <laughs> but like all of the ideas and stuff that you could get from that system, it's just beautiful. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like I, I got into RPGs like playing D&D. &D, and then I started finding like little hints that there was an indie system beyond what wizards uh had put out for us and 
like, like White Wolf and all those folks at the bookstores. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And, you know, only a couple of years ago, like I saw the indie scene like blow up on the internet or whatever. But like back in like the early 2000s when we were all like on dial up and stuff, like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, where I'd started like really getting into playing them like, like more seriously with people. Yeah. It's, it started with Thrash and then I just kind of moved on from there. Very cool. You mentioned in our earlier episodes that you've kind of been forced into that GM role. Uh, but when you sit down to make characters, when you're playing a game, what is your personal process? Well, my personal process is pretty much written down in the in the book. I, I like to start off with a cool concept and then uh, see if the game supports it or not. You know, mm-hmm. and if it doesn't, I just try to make my character fit as much as possible to uh, to the game's constraints. You mm-hmm. know, where it's like if I want. A uh, half orc that can jump over buildings and things like it's kind of hard to do that in Pathfinder, but like you know, I'll find a way. Like if I have to reskin, like the fly spell to only last for a turn or something, just to allow me to jump mm-hmm. and then give me like a turn of feather fall or something. Like you know, we do something like that. We'll f- we'll find a feat that lets me do it. <laughs> yeah, but uh, yeah, I just like digging through my books and just like seeing what options are available and then seeing if I can make concepts around that the other way around, you know? So I either start with a concept or I find something that like really tickles my fancy and see if I can build a character around that one thing. Nice. Very cool. So getting to Tidebreaker, uh, how do we think character creation in this game stacks up to other systems that we've played? Um, I think that... Tiebreaker's character system is a lot more open-ended than a lot of games on the market. Um, it's pretty fast for its, oh, what I like to call its weight class. Yeah. <laughs> you know, where you have, like, uh, very soft games, and then you have, like, rules medium games, and then, like, really rules-heavy games, like, like say, like Shadowrun. Yeah. Right? Um, where Tiebreaker kind of fits more in a rules medium like it's leaning towards light because the math is very easy. Like it's all pluses. There's no negatives. There's no multiplication division, whatever, whatever. It's just plus one this. And the plus ones are not like particularly common. Like you, you'll end up getting more rerolls than more math. Yeah. The way the game is uh, set up. Um, So like on that crunch side, you know, we're, we're right in the middle of the road. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um, and as far as like making most of your character, like you get your concept, you get your your jobs, quirks, you, you roll your stats and you pick a couple of things out of a list for for your quirks and your standout features. Mm-hmm. And then when you get to your abilities, like it's either really easy if you have a if you have a, a solid concept or you're already have uh read the game once or twice, you know, and you understand how the mechanics work or it can be or it can take a while. Because it's a game with a lot of options. Mm-hmm. Like, I, there's yeah. no way to, like, talk my way around that, yeah. you know? And people can get, like, analysis paralysis if they don't have, like, a very solid, like, foothold on what they want, mm-hmm. you know? Mm-hmm. But the game provides pretty much everything that you can want. Like, in the realms of, like, I want to kick this guy in this particular way. Mm-hmm. You know, or like, I want to be this kind of ninja. I want to be this kind of politician. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like, we have mechanics that fit those kind of things. It's like, mm-hmm. uh, like I was saying in the previous episode, Tidebreaker does three things very well. Like, we do fighting very well. We do negotiation stuff very well. And we do espionage. Okay. Mm-hmm. Um, in that order, actually. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, like, I really like um, how you can go in with the concept and build the abilities and all the mechanic portion of mm-hmm. your characters through those concepts. Uh, but I also like that you're, you're able to reverse that, like looking at the cool stuff that you want and then pulling concepts out of the different combinations. Uh, it, it sounds like it, it, you could put a lot of time into that second way of doing it and, and get a really interesting character out of it. If you looked at mechanics first, Mm-hmm. Um, but I, I really like that th- it's an option, right? Yeah. You, you're not like forced down. Uh, okay. You have to do a concept first and then you can do this. 
um, or you have to choose your two things per ability and figure out what sort of ability that makes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I definitely think that, like, once you have a little bit of familiarity with it, like, which obviously the hope is now after people listen to this, um, they'll have a little bit of a sense of, like, oh, okay, this is what the process of character creation looks like. I think now having done it once, it would be a lot quicker for me. Um, you know, I do <laughs> I do have a problem when there's, like, too many choices. I get a little bit, like, overwhelmed and my brain shuts down. Um, yeah, but, you're not the first person right. that we've well, had that's had that problem. You know, I think that's one of those things of, like, what are you looking for in a game? And, like, you know, for some people, that's going to be, like, a highlight is like, I have so many choices. I can do whatever I want. I can, you know, and I definitely think I prefer having a huge list of options to somebody being like, I don't know, make it up. Cause then I go, uh, like I've forgotten my name in the days of the week. And like, I just like my mind blank, no thoughts, mm -hmm. head empty. Um, I like having some options to pick from, you know, and I think having done it once now, I would be like more comfortable with like where things are and like what things I need to pick, you know? Yeah. yeah I like giving people the ability to just, you know, just do what you want to do. Right. But I also like having like grounded options for people mm -hmm. because I understand that people can fall under either of those like spectrums. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And uh, like I was saying about Faith the other episode is that it's really more like do what you want to do. But if you don't know what you want to do, then the game is very light. Right. Mm -hmm. like, there's not much game under that, mm -hmm. like with the, at least with Accelerator. Right. Um, but with Tidebreaker, I was like, what if I took that feeling and just gave it just a tad bit more weight? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. And like a little bit of more like, look, this is exactly what you can do in this game like at a bare bare minimum bare bones level like you have all of these options right yeah those options are not the limit and that's not me saying oh well it's an rpg so you can do whatever you want <laughs> right. right like like no like you literally just do like whatever you want like <laughs> you know what i mean like like we've got like all of the like supporting mechanics that help you just say hey like what if i just wanted to play like a fighter jet or something yeah. you know what i mean yeah, no, Go you've given it. everybody all of the little Lego bricks to, like, build the thing yeah. that they mm -hmm. wanted to build. Yeah, it's a big old Lego brick game system. Mm -hmm. Like, you can build, like, anything within the realms of, like, your standard action movie stuff. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And a little bit more. Like, you know, because, like, I like things other than action movies. But, you know, like, my, my movie watching interests, like, I typically <laughs> like... Uh, like side drama, like philosoph like not side dramas, uh, psychological thrillers yes. and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah, you know, what I mean, like I like spy thrillers. I like like martial arts films mm -hmm. and things. So I put a little bit of me into like everything. Yeah, right. Like, and I like to think of myself as a pretty average guy as far as my viewing mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. viewing interests go. Yeah, well, and we talked you about know. that before too. That's what's wonderful about the world of RPGs is that there is like something for everybody, and I don't think that there's a whole lot of impetus to like make a thing that isn't you. Like, you should make a thing yeah. that, like, reflects something that you want to play because that's where your passion is, you know? Mm -hmm. Like, it, yeah. if you don't love romance games, I don't think that you're the person to make me a romance game then. Like, that's maybe <laughs> just really not, not, you know. I'm going to try just to spite myself, but, like. <laughs> like, it's a fun thought exercise, but, like, maybe there are people that are better suited to that. And that's, again, totally okay. Um, mm -hmm. that's going to be one of my game jam projects yeah. is just to, like make a romance game I'm going to sit there and like because like the, the fact of the matter is I do like watching chick flicks right mm -hmm. <laughs> it's not my it's not my bread and butter genre but like you, you know like I've watched like 50 first dates and stuff which is not really a chick flick per se but like you know like mm -hmm. you know like, I've watched like Legally Blonde and like uh, The Notebook yeah mm -hmm. Like I, I watch sappy stuff and comedies and things, and like I, I want to make game mechanics around those because I like game mechanics. Right, mm -hmm. right. So, like, and I take a lot of my inspiration from the from the media that I watch. You know, Absolutely. like I like to look at that thing and say, "Hey, I'm gonna turn that into a game mechanic." Yeah, mm, there you go. <laughs> and I like when stuff like that shines through in games when you're like, "Okay, I can see like where this came from," because as a player, I'm like, "Oh, I know what I'm supposed to do with that." Then when there's like that. Mm -hmm parallel comparison where it's like you're like it's like action movies and i'm like okay i know what i'm supposed to do with these mechanics i, I know what this game is meant to look like and like 
what kind of character is going to thrive in this kind of game. Mm-hmm. Like, this is not the sort of game for me to make, like, I don't know, like a plucky lawyer who falls in love. Like, I don't know. <laughs> that's like, that's not what but, this is for, and that's you, okay. You could definitely do a plucky lawyer. Right. It's just like, I don't think the love focus would be right. what yeah. tiebreaker would uh, right. suit on too much. Like, it's it's like you could kind of do that as like a side block kind of thing, but. Right. Like we don't have a lot of like like courting kind of mechanics, or mm-hmm. there's nothing for like the oh I've made a mistake and now I have to like run into the rain to meet you at the airport port with a little sign and a boombox that says I love you playing our favorite song that we met, which is a callback to the beginning of the movie when we had our little quirky meet cute. <laughs> what are you and saying see, that see, romance movies are formulaic? I'm saying all <laughs> movies are formulaic. I am a. <laughs> I am a huge advocate of TV tropes that work. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. Um, and so through my like extensive like wiki diving of TV tropes, like <laughs> I've developed a very large vocabulary for just like the different things that appear in movies, because that's what TV tropes offers. Mm-hmm. It's just like a like a lightly academic, but like, you know, so like lighthearted kind of approach to just movie analysis. Mm -hmm. Well, fiction media analysis in general. So like, I think in TV tropes terms for like everything, Mm -hmm. which is why I was like, Hey, a meet cute for like blah, 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 blah. Right. Yeah. Cause like, you know, cause meet cutes are like a very staple trope in the, in uh, the romance genre. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, like, you know, you have like that guy, he's like having a bad day. Like he's like, his girlfriend's terrible to him. And then suddenly like, he's just like walking around and the manic pitsy dream girl chick is like, all like, Hey, like you're really stuffy and stuff. And why I like, um, K-pop and whatever. So why don't you come to the karaoke with me? And the guy's like, well, I don't do that. Like, I like to just drink lemonade at home and like start iron my pants. (laughs) And she's like, Dude, you need to get a life. And I have like absolutely no realistic way that I would be attracted to you in any sort of situation other than this romance plot. (laughs) (laughs) But I have decided that I like you, which is why the manic pitsy dream girl is also a terrible trope for amongst other reasons. But like when it works, it works. Mm -hmm. Uh, Tropes are not bad. Yeah. Yeah. Which is. Absolutely. Also, another TV trope entry. <laughs> <laughs> so how do we think that the process of character creation in this game sort of sets expectations? How does it tell you what playing this game is going to be like? Well, the character uh, generation thing is it's just going to tell you that this game is going to be very much focused on you being good at what you do and that you're probably going to punch something. <laughs> yeah. And you've got options, lots of options for what punching something means. You've got options for how exactly what happens after you've hit something. What happens if you miss? Like um, ways to get out of binds, ways to get into binds. Like character creation is going to tell you that, like, look, you've got options. Work with them. You're, you've got uh, what we didn't cover in the last episode were our hooks and our questions and things, which I'll go over briefly here is... uh. Tiebreaker characters are motivated. They're extremely motivated people. Mm-hmm. Just, these are not the kind of folks that just sit down and play video games all day and then do nothing about it. You know what I mean? Which is me in real life. I'm not a tiebreaker. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, I just wrote it. <laughs> um, you know, but it's like you have goals and these goals pick up questions. And the questions are basically like, like having that, um, Saturday morning cartoon announcer or like literally because my playtesters is like, can you put the DBZ announcer as a mechanic into the game? And I said, maybe I'll give it a shot. And then I did. All right. <laughs> um, so like we literally have a, um, a next time on Tidebreaker. <laughs> Will this character f- fulfill their dream of overcoming the Dark Lord? Blah, blah, blah. Find out on the next time that we meet up. Oh, and cool. also here's your keys and things for the session. Um, but like, yeah, so you have, uh, will I beat the Dark Lord as one of your questions? And that question is a tied to a hook of I need to save the world or something like mm-hmm. that. OK. And then when you answer those questions, 
it fills the hook, fulfills the hook, and then you get more hope, maximum hope to your party's pool and stuff. Oh, very cool. But like um, those questions are part of the full character creation experience after you've built your scenario, right? Mm-hmm. And your GM has this big bad eagle guy that has all of these abilities and these minions and artifacts. And like, there's a lot to the GM session of the game that we didn't cover in the last episode, Mm -hmm. but uh, it's a lot of tools to make this world and to make your villain like larger than life. Right. Like you want a mastermind that's just kind of like twirl their mustache and tie people to the railroad, you know, Mm -hmm. like we've got that, you know, but characters creation is referencing all of these possibilities that can happen. Yeah. Like through that. Absolutely. So uh, how do you think the the process of creating the world together uh, affects the the character creation process then? Well, it gives you all of the answers to all of your personal questions to what do we need? Mm -hmm. Like what, what do, what should I be building towards? Right. Cause we built towards Dragon Ball Z where like I being only one of the three of us that extensively watched it built a GBZ character. Yeah. But from based on what I told y'all, you built slightly science fiction, martial arts inspired characters. Yes. Right. But that's what we, but that's what we worked towards. Cause we, what we did in that first like five minutes or so was kind of do the scenario generation, but very diluted. Was kind <laughs> yeah. of explain to Amelia what DBZ is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Effectively. Um, but like when you're doing the scenario generation, like you're picking all of the things that you want to see in the game. And that's going to affect your characters because like, hey, like I want to play a game where there's cyborgs and giant monsters or something like that. Mm -hmm. Right. And so you take those things and you take all of those ideas that you have in your head based on what you know about cyborgs and giant monsters. And then you build your characters around that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. So it's like, hey, I have uh, hidden compartments in my arms. It's one of my abilities and they shoot missiles. Or something like that. Yeah. Like this one is a is an eye laser. This one is like a machine gun turret on my other arm. Like and that's three characters for your your like kind of like pseudo terminator kind of thing. Right? Mm-hmm. And like Amelia might build something with a grappling hook and like sleep dust or something. And then an escape ability so she can have like a support hunter. I'm sorry, I kind of just stuffed you in that role. Like that's sets this on my part. My bad. <laughs> Ryan yeah. usually plays the support uh, character. I usually play the backstabbing friend. That's true. I honestly play support characters a lot myself. Um, I I actually built, I don't know if you saw it in the, the functions list. There's a lot of roguey sh- in that game uh, because I play rogues. I play tanks and I play healers. Like when I play MMOs and stuff or, or Overwatch, like I like those kind of characters. Yeah, like I like when I play Overwatch, I always play healers, but in RPGs, I will never, ever, ever play them. <laughs> yeah. That's because healing is not proactive uh, at all. Like it's Lucio and Mercy are amazing. So. Yeah. Well, I'm talking about in, um, <laughs> in RPGs, right? right? Like, because like an RPG is like you're healing a character, you're basically wasting a turn. Like you're better off just killing your target, right. like just from a tactical perspective, and mm-hmm. then heal them afterwards. Yeah. You know, which is like one and of the like big never like looks cool. It's never like yeah, like you're not really doing anything. You're just kind of you're like undoing, I guess undoing something that happened. Which like it's yeah semi common GM advice to like not do that kind of thing. Right. Mm-hmm. But the healer role in most RPGs is exactly that. Right. Mm-hmm. Or in Tidebreaker, we kind of cover that with like having things that remove attrition, but also give you ignite and stuff based on how much attrition you lost mm-hmm. or whatever. So like being a healer in Tidebreaker is fun. Mm-hmm. Like, right. <laughs> um, you know, it's because it's a proactive thing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Or we have like reactive abilities, like just increasing the defense to the point where like you can't touch me. Like your magic roll did that, which is kind of like you went from the utility, which is mostly support based functions down there, mm-hmm. but you made a monster out of that. <laughs> right? Because I think that utility characters should be monstrous. Yeah. Right. Um, but yeah, like that's that's just kind of my spin as a as a guy that plays a lot of support characters in video games. Mm-hmm. Like, <laughs> you know, like I like support. I like tanks. I like rogues. That's typically what I do. Like I I definitely play the two-handed barbarian that's screaming bloody murder occasionally too i'm not gonna lie because that's my personality but when i'm in a group setting i usually go for the role that's needed because i know somebody else might have more fun being that berserker Mm -hmm. 
and somebody might actually be better than me gasp as the berserker mm-hmm. <laughs> but like a lot of people don't like playing support i yeah. do i like helping people there you go <laughs> um we're gonna ask you the hard question and then after that's the easy up? question uh what do you think is one of the flaws of this system and then what do you feel like is one of the best parts uh, one of my flaws of the system is that I have way too many options. Mm-hmm. Mm. Uh, it's very, very easy to have a character. I mean, like have uh, analysis paralysis in my game. Like that is one of the biggest deterrents to Tidebreaker is that it's off putting if you haven't played RPGs before. Mm-hmm. Unless you're with somebody that's pretty like, like semi knowledgeable of like the 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 medium. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, like my my former boss has taught it to his kids and they've picked it up and they're like 10 and minus. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So like it's easy to pick up once you've read it. Yeah. But like it's uh, as much as much as I try to make it very like every man kind of speech is like, look, we're telling stories. You do dice. You do this. You add these abilities together. You do you do things. Mm-hmm. Right. But um, it's not it's not like, say, uh, geez, I'm trying to think of like something like really, really simple to play. Uh, say like Rysis or something like that might be might be easier in my game. Mm-hmm. Where Rysis is just kind of like you you have like a, a quirk and then you have like a couple of things. Roll some dice. Go. Or or like like lasers and feelings. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Would be like much easier to play in Tidebreaker. Like because that's as light as you can get. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Is that something that you you feel like is just a trade off that you have to make because of the kind of game you want to have, or is that something that you're kind of looking for ways to do something about? Both, but mm-hmm. I'm leaning more towards it's a trade off. Yeah, like if I can min max my ease of use versus the death of play, mm-hmm. I will do as best as I can, totally. and I've done that over the last like five or so updates I've done over the last two years. Mm -hmm. But um, when you're making games like this, like it's very much a uh, design choice that you have to make implicitly. Absolutely. Like this is a very intentional that I've made that that choice because like, Hey, I understand that there's a lot of options and that's going to cause analysis paralysis. But if I don't have a lot of options, you don't have a lot of options. The only other thing I could do is make the game as extremely, um, what is the word I'm looking for? It's uh, that kind of death that's like, it's simple, but like you keep like stacking upon it with like a couple of options that can be used a bunch of different ways. Mm -hmm. Like it's the term is slipping for me right now, but, um, but it's a specific type of design that like you, you build like very few options that can be used in hundreds of ways. Oh yeah. Uh, Super giant games, transistor, emergent complexity. That's the word. Oh, there you go. Never would have gotten that. Like, (laughs) yeah. um, Yeah. Or you go for emergent complexity, like, uh, but doing emergent complexity in a way that's uh, intentional Mm -hmm. is very hard. Yeah. Um, Tidebreaker tries that as much as possible. Uh, because like ultimately tiebreaker is roll a couple of D sets for your pool, add some dice if you do some stunts and then you have functions that change how often you add power level, how often you re-roll yeah. for the most part, like, um, and then movement, but that's the game, like in, in a nutshell, like mm-hmm. we build on a couple of, uh, very simple concepts and then we add a ton of options that alter those to, to your perspective specific preferences so like emergent complexity is a goal that i have been doing but like you can do what i did in that regard but limit it to even more choices Mm -hmm. but you would have to have those choices be extremely divergent Mm -hmm. from each other right Mm -hmm. and i think i mentioned super giants transistor when i was talking about emergent complexity like before um yeah transistor is amazing because like you have i think like 12 different functions in that game that get paired up like uh, I think it's like two or three different combinations, right? Okay. Uh, which is kind of how I came up with Tiebreaker's ABC system. Mm-hmm. But those two or three different combinations equal hundreds of different combinations, mm-hmm. right? That fulfill dozens of dozens and dozens of playstyles. 
in ways that were like you can look at those and go wow okay so like i can make this missile rebound or i can not even make this a missile anymore and just make my sword explode on things mm-hmm. right mm-hmm. yeah and if you haven't played transistor it's it's fantastic the the the, the ability design in that game is like it's triple a hmm. like i mean super giant games is not a small company but like you know they're not like they're comparatively pretty small <laughs> Yeah, they're not as like big as something like Ubisoft or yeah, something. Oh yeah. mm-hmm. Like, and, like you would never get that kind of design out of like Assassin's Creed. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Like Assassin's Creed is triple A game. It's huge. It's a blockbuster. It's like you're going around ancient Greece and now like um, wherever Valhalla takes place. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, you know what I'm saying? But like, but like that, the very simple concepts that Super Giant does in their games. Because all of their games uh, ha- have that same kind of design philosophy. Yeah, I mean, Hades, of, I think, has a lot of that, too. Where right, it's like Hades. You have, like, your couple of boons, and then you start stacking them, and they start, like, combining to be different things until, like, you have, yeah, like, Hades is the of pinnacle of that, of because it's, it's not even the boon starting there. This mm-hmm. is a reference that I get. Um. <laughs> yeah, with Hades, it's four actions. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you, you have, have your, attack. your attack, your dash, your special. You have a dash, a special, and a cast. Mm-hmm. And those are changed by your weapons. They're changed by your keepsakes and by your boons and by Daedalus. Mm-hmm. Like, cause Daedalus, like he's a boon. Yes. But Not like, really. yeah, yeah. He's like, a, a like a force modifier, basically like, like, and it really starts to shine. Like, especially when you use the adamant rail, right. Or the etzograph. Yeah. Um, because etzograph starts as a machine gun. Mm-hmm. Right. With a very small clip and a grenade launcher. OK. And then you have your regular cast and you have your dash. But with Daedalus, you can turn Etzograph's um, grenade launcher into one giant cluster bomb, like a big rocket. Or you could turn it into a fast rocket or you could turn it into like eight rockets at once. Hmm. And that's just what you can do on your queue if you're playing on PC. Right. That's not touching the rifle part. That's just the special. And then you add boons to that. So, like, say we went with the the six different cluster bomb mm-hmm. things, and then we added Zeus to it. Yeah, right. <laughs> you know, well, and, and then, then it, Zeus you start is... to get like the combos of things where it's like if they have this condition, then this one happens. And too, that condition, and, and then, then all of those like, stack. Uh, right. Like all your, mm. They're so good. That's a good game. Everyone yeah, all that stacks. Hades. It's... it's great. I did not think yeah. I would like it, and I love it. <laughs> Yeah, Hades is definitely Hades. like a fantastic game. Shout out to Super Giant uh, Games. It's one that my like, son and I have been bonding over. Like we sit at the kitchen table and play together, and like he's like, "Oh, I got this one. Which boon should I pick for this?" And, like, oh, it's so good. It's so good. And its accessibility <laughs> options are top notch too. Uh, with and the God you can mode. have pretty great poly relationships, which uh, yeah, I it's love. fantastic. It's very mm-hmm. LGBT friendly it's, too, which I'm very yeah. much for. Like that's kind of. Uh, one of my my big platforms is like I feel like everybody deserves to be a badass, yeah. and like that's one of Tidebreaker's like main standpoints is that I want people to feel badass while playing my games. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? So like whoever you are, like if you have a disability or if you're gay or whatever, like it doesn't matter if you're black. <laughs> um, uh, dear listeners, you can't see, but. <laughs> Follow me on Twitter. Look at my profile picture. Understand why that joke hits hard. <laughs> you um, couldn't see the jazz hands that went along with it, but it was great. <laughs> but, you know, that being able to talk like that, like at the table, like I feel like um, is important for me. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like having my game say like, look, you're welcome. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Is important to me. That's that goes into my game design. It mm-hmm. goes into like, say, look, this is a collaborative world building experience. Like back in the back session of my GM session, like I say, keep it heroic. It's not just a hashtag. OK, like I want everybody to feel like a hero mm-hmm. or a heroine or hero, whatever your gender pronoun turns that into. I don't know exactly how that works, but I want you to feel good. OK, like he rocks. <laughs> Yeah, or you could hero. just be hero. It's, it's fine. Yeah, like, <laughs> um, oh man, that's cringe on my part. My bad. Uh, <laughs> please don't hate me, Twitter. <laughs> I love you. Okay. <laughs> um, but yeah, I want you to feel good. Like that's 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 who I am, and that's how I want my games to shine in that way. Like you're gonna play my game because you're a badass. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know what I mean, that's it. 
Like, um, well, let's stop it. <laughs> Excellent. Well, uh, let's go then into uh, one of my favorite portions of the show, uh, the fan fiction portion, uh, where we get to figure out uh, what brought these people together and what do we what do we do uh, once we're together? What sort of uh, shenanigans do we get up to? Yeah, what is it? What is our hook for this group of people? Why are we together? Yeah, how did the actual DBZ character come up with the Space Ninja and the Magical Girl? <laughs> well, okay, so Amelia, your character, what is it, Falcon Swift? Yeah. <laughs> uh, you're, you're effectively coming out of retirement, right? Right. Um, right. I mean, I feel like there's got to be some kind of, like, tournament arc Yeah, here. there's definitely a tournament or something. Um, like, we're the quirky, like, B group. <laughs> yeah, mm-hmm. I got to, like, defend my title. It's just, like... There is an insidious evil that takes something more than screaming really loud <laughs> and shooting giant blasts that's going to dig its trails, int- like tendrils, mm. into the earth and then take control of the world. And the only people that can stop this is, for some reason, not Goku, because all he does is scream and throw giant beams at things. <laughs> <laughs> So, yeah. so if we, okay, so I like the, the concept of a tournament. What if it's like a, like a, a trio tournament, like a group tournament mm. where you have to have a trio to enter um, and we need to get to the top of the tournament. Uh, as I'm thinking, uh, Nick, your character and I probably knew each other before the tournament. And I want to say we were kind of under the idea of, hey, we need to get to the top to to stop so and so who's also in the tournament, and yeah. and maybe that's where we reached out like we need a third. Uh, who better can we get than Falcon Swift, the the former champion from, you know, the singles division? I don't know what you want to call it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I like that. Um, can I would say that of retirement is a talk show host. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. That um, Falcon Swift was doing a um, a segment on uh, on the new martial artist and ghost fighting because you know uh, Niet's a an exorcist. Yeah, mm, that's right. Right, and you're a magical girl, which I feel like just as as a correlation to my own character, also kind of fights like evil spirits and stuff. Yeah, right? yeah. So, so we do that, and um, Amelia's character kind of like gets us together, and she, through her various interviews and things, has found that there is an underlurking threat within the tournament. Ooh. But we have to go under the guise of just being regular martial artists and stuff. And while we do that, we explore the uh, the deep underpinnings of the secret society that have been taking the ghost of defeated characters and like making them possess the uh, different martial artists and stuff. Oh, yeah. A vast and, conspiracy. Yeah, and through that, they will eventually overcome the Z fighters, like Goku, Piccolo, and Vegeta and them, right? Mm-hmm. And they, because all of their powers happen to be extremely like direct damage types, with the exception of Master Roshi, who's indisposed. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Because uh, otherwise, you know, like he would just solve the plot on himself because the evil <laughs> containment wave. There you go. Uh, but maybe it's just too much. And like we end up having to have Roshi like uh, uh, help us. Like he teaches us a little bit of his his ways to um, to contain uh, demons and evil spirits and things. Mm-hmm. And like maybe I'm one of Roshi's students and that's how I got through it. And like Roshi is currently away in, in space somewhere, probably still during the tournament power arc where all of them are gone. Okay. <laughs> you know what I mean? And so back home, we're solving this problem because every other cast member on the show is gone. Okay. <laughs> oh, the B team. Well, we're the C team. Oh, that's <laughs> the C team. Yeah. I like that. Oh, yeah, I think that would work special. out really well. <laughs> yeah, we're team C. We're definitely the filler arc. <laughs> is, this, is this where we get our own spinoff or attempted spinoff? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, I think so. Or at least a made-for-TV movie. Yeah. Dragon Ball Z for Ghost. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. I like that. Yeah, I think that'll work out. And if then, we had episode uh, titles, that's what this would be called. Dragon Ball G. 
<laughs> yep. <laughs> yeah, no, that's that's great. Um I don't know. I don't think I don't think there's anything we really need to add to that. That's pretty No, I feel like we nailed it. Yeah. Goodness. Yeah, pretty good at improvising stuff. There you go. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, then let's get into our advancement discussion uh, and take it up a level. Take it up a level. Take it up a level. All right. I like that. So in this segment, we cover character advancement and character growth within the system. So let's start by uh, the mechanical part. Um, When characters, quote unquote, level up, what does that look like? How does that work? Oh, we don't have a level-based system, but we definitely have progression. Mm -hmm. And the progression type is actually one of the key features of the game. Because you can alter Tidebreaker to fit, like, any kind of playstyle that you like. Uh, We're going to also add something later uh, before Kickstarter is called the Grooves Update, which uh, changes uh, very basic features of Tidebreaker. Like, maybe you're not rolling dice anymore. Maybe you're playing with tarot cards. Mm. But changing your progression would be one of the things that... uh, that you do, but tiebreaker comes pre-installed in the, uh, well, installed using computer terms anyway, uh, with a couple of different progression types that you can use to advance your characters. The standard progression is, um, whenever you do a trick, which is to just, uh, do a regular stunt, but add a function to your attack at the end of it, uh, you get a key. If you get five keys, you get an upgrade. Uh, each of your ability has five unlock po- points to access. Uh, whenever you perform a trick, you mark a checkbox for the key. That's the associated ability you associate a trick with. Uh, when you have your fourth trick, and that's your fourth key. Um, oh, wait, I have that's a typo. Uh, when you have your fifth trick, and that's your fifth key, uh, you pick an unlock, and the keys you get uh, cannot be used for unlock points on other ability tracks, and any you gain after your fifth has been gained are lost, so you just switch up your your uh, tricks and your abilities as you go, or else your progression is going to stagnate just a bit. Uh, and that's the standard progression type. Um, so, do stunts, get keys. Uh, so, the looter progression type is more for our, our old-school OSR type of uh, type fam mm-hmm. where beating up monsters and taking your stuff is their idea of fun so whenever you do a trick in combat you instead gain momentum equal to your wits uh, but you don't mark the trick on your character sheet instead you'll gain new functions permanently when you find them in the form of new weapons spells scrolls etc that your gm spreads across the gaming world so i.e treasure uh, at the end of battle or any my- milestone scene which is finishing up a goal or permanently dealing with a major enemy uh you gain uh or if you gain loot you mark a key so you get your five and then you get an online point and those are our two main uh progression types in the current early assets edition oh that's interesting do you then choose one or the other when you're playing or yeah the gm says hey we're gonna play be playing standard progression or we're gonna be playing uh looter or whatever else we add uh before kickstarter's over nice cool that's um, cool. I'm working with uh, by Francita at by Francita on a uh, Twitter um, on her own personal setting that's going to be released alongside Tidebreaker, which we are calling Piety, which is based on uh, a city with several different religions and things. And her her setting is going to also be the reason why I'm making a another progression for. Uh, for devotion so like hmm. uh, the more you worship a particular god or so like uh, you get keys that way okay Very cool. and there'll be like new tables and things for the things that you can get like uh getting um boons and things to apply to your weapons and stuff cool. nice. so like you can get your weapons enchanted and stuff using by francita's progression nice uh so what what effect does this advancement have on the narrative uh does does the mechanical benefit represent something in the story yeah, actually. Um, so, like, one of the best ones for that is called Blending, is one of the upgrades that we have. So, you can choose upon reaching an upgrade point to expand upon your abilities by picking a source, either yourself via another ability you have, one of your allies' abilities, or recurring villain slash the environment. So, based on your choice, you can install a function from that source to an ability of your choice. Uh, the install is just means that one of the tricks that you know... Uh, it becomes part of your core ability. Hmm. So say like uh, my martial arts ability of flurry and overwhelming. Like if I wanted to like say now it's massive and I can hit everybody in the zone, 
when you use a trick the first time, you get that for free. Every other time you want to use a trick, it costs five momentum. So if I install it, it's just part of my core ability oh. and I can massive flurry overwhelming everybody all day long. Cool. Okay. That's very cool. For instance, like if I wanted to blend instead and say, wow, um, Falcon's like ability to like just move like really freaking fast would be really nice. So like I would like to put like hyper on my martial arts instead, you know, mm-hmm. like so that's pretty cool. So I could do that. Oh, nice. Very cool. And yeah. And then we have uh sync, which is very like much tied to like story stuff um, because you get to roll cliffhanger with an ally. Uh, you practice together. You learn how to combine the effects of one of your abilities. Uh, failure creates a training related issue. Um, you can try again once you deal with the issue. Uh, issues are just like things that block your, your story progression. Um, and they restore hope when you get over them. Okay. So you spend 10 momentum each to add your ally successes to your attack and your attack triggers on your on the slowest teammates turn that's involved with the with the synced upgrade. Oh, very cool. So like fans of Chrono Trigger will notice that as the dual techs. Oh, nice. So we have team attacks in Tidebreaker. Hey, I like that. Um, very cool. So, uh, the, uh, yeah, it sounds like a very interesting advancement um, mm-hmm. uh, with a lot of uh, fun little options that you could have in there. Yeah. Cool. Uh, well, is there anything else that you want to say about Tidebreaker before we uh, head out for the episode, Nick? Well, I'll say um, <laughs> we've got tons and tons of GM stuff. Uh, checked out the early access edition, look through the GM session and check out our artifacts and stuff. Like if you want to do like Indiana Jones, if you want to do like you know, various horror movie stuff, like whatever we got, like whatever you want, we're probably going to put it in there some way somehow through what we already have there or through the grooves coming up mm-hmm. like um for instance like we have fear breaker that's going to be coming out with for uh tiebreaker is one of the grooves where like the attrition which normally would uh go away after a combat or an intense scene it stays oh, wow. and your bad guys get the ability to off-screen teleport and sneak up behind you oh. and harbingers will also like emulate jump scares doing that mm-hmm. right so like Genre emulation is going to be one of Tidebreaker's strong suits. And while the core experience is definitely like more action element oriented, uh, Tidebreaker is meant to be hackable through grooves. Mm. So like people that want to put out their own supplements for this game can just make grooves for the game. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And then write their settings because like, you know, I, I know people like writing settings, but they might not want to be too much into making their whole entire game or, encamp- or mechanics and stuff, yeah. which is part of why like PBTA is so successful because like it's super easy to just make a PBTA hack. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, you just make new moves and you're pretty much done. You yeah. just write a setting and make everything fit whatever um, tropes and stuff that you were trying to go for and, and you're good. Yeah. Like with Tiebreaker, I kind of want to do the same process, but you don't have to buy like a new whole book or design a whole full game for every single thing that you want to put out. Like just write some setting books and say, Hey, or we're using this groove, this groove and this groove and call it a day. If you want to build a new subsystem, go for it. But like, we're very, we're very uh, designer friendly. We're very writer friendly Mm -hmm. with this game. Um, My dream is to put out a store similar to the DMs guild, but without the tomfoolery associated with that. (laughs) Um, (laughs) Like, you know, like I want to take like a very small cut so mm-hmm. I can pay for my my network costs and stuff like maybe like three, three to four percent, maybe. Yeah. Like I'm not good with numbers, but I think DM skill takes like like seven to eight. Well, something and then ridiculous like they like that. own it, don't they? Like mm-hmm. there's like yeah, there's they like own whole it. Thing you can't and, like yeah, post can't. it on other things. Yeah. Like, look, I don't care. Give me a shout out. Give me a couple of dollars throw it all over the place as far as i'm concerned you're giving me free marketing right because yeah. well, <laughs> then people are playing the game that goes along with it mm-hmm. yeah so like i want to give folks a storefront and a place to make their own stuff yeah well, cool. i know we you talked know about saying? that with a j too that like and bolts is like the very issue with like genesis hacks and stuff like that too of like i want to like own my own stuff and you know 
a J is a good friend of mine. Like, uh, like I said, he's been very mm-hmm. influential to how I have uh, been approaching things on a business uh, standpoint. Like I wouldn't have put out an early access edition if it wasn't for AJ. So like, uh, thanks. Thanks, bro. <laughs> Hope you're listening to this. Like, you know, AJ actually. <laughs> Like he better be listening to this. Like he actually hooked me up with y'all. So like, you know what I mean? That'd be super ironic. (laughs) Um, Yeah. But like a a J is very much about like getting paid for your work. And like, I didn't think that my work was going to be worth money until I had money, you know, to like pay for all the pretty art and stuff. And I want this game on stores, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know, like I want, to build a platform for other people, you know, Mm -hmm. like, cause there's a lot of marginalized folks that aren't getting the spotlight that they need, you know? And like, uh, my friend, my friend deep anyway, they, they say like to decenter yourself from the conversation when it comes to that. But like, I can't do that until I have a platform yet. Right. You know what I'm saying? To like, to decenter myself from, right. Like I want to be put into a position where I can help others and then step aside. Mm -hmm. Mm Mm-hmm. You know, but like that starts with getting the enough money to get the art to attract the people that are outside of my small mm-hmm. totally. Twitter social circle. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Like I've got 1,200 some odd followers at the moment, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. And maybe 30 or 40 of them are, are ever like actively like listening to what I'm saying. Yeah. Right. You know what I mean? Shout out to the other like 1,100 of y'all, but (laughs) (laughs) like, I still love you. (laughs) Like, like my love is not dependent on you supporting my money, my my work monetarily speaking. Like, I like that you're just there. Like, you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Like, even if you come by, you give me a like every once in a while. If you're just lurking and reading, thank you. You Mm -hmm. know, like, like I wouldn't be where I am now talking on podcasts and stuff at all. Like if it wasn't for, for those folks that were following me, occasionally retweeting me, or just making me look more important than I actually am by following me. Right. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Mm-hmm. It's like I look like a juicier target because I'm plus a thousand versus like 40 or mm-hmm. something. You know totally. what I mean? Yeah, there's definitely value in in things like that, like follows and likes. And like as much as we want to be like, it does I don't care how many people. Yeah, follow it's just me. numbers. It's like, like, no, I'm definitely I'm definitely more influential than I was when I started. You know what right. I mean? Right. Well, and like, you know, I and there's a I there's want a certain to power that comes to that. that. I make. Like, you know. Yeah, I really do. I want to help people. Mm-hmm. You know? Totally. And I can't do that until I get to a position where I'm where I actually have the power to do so, mm-hmm. yeah. you know, like I want to be like uh, one of my contemporaries for, for my, the ego of my part for saying that would be Brandon Ditson, mm. like for, from Swordsfall, you know what I'm saying? That guy's got 14.5 K, yeah, you know, and he's doing amazing things. Mm-hmm. I don't agree with everything he's saying, but I love the dude because like he and I, like we may not be approaching things exactly the same way, but his goals are very similar to my goals mm-hmm. where he wants black people to do well yeah. right? in games. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. So like, like as far as him is concerned, like I love the dude for that. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? But I have to get to where he's at to like even have a shot. Right. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Like it's like hundred thousand some dollar kickstarters that he's been doing and stuff. Like it's amazing. Oh, yeah. Yeah, right? absolutely. Like um, with AJ with like, what is he at? Like three, three point three something K like did like 30,000. Mm-hmm. And like he gets to keep like most of that, you know, like after he pays his uh, artists and everyone else who's helping him because yeah. he didn't even print. You know what I'm saying? Right. Like, like yeah. he just did his stuff as PDF and he was done. Mm-hmm. Like I, I want to be in stores, exactly. you know, so like my goals are a lot loftier mm-hmm. than his, <laughs> you know, <laughs> like I've got some ambition, but I need help. Mm-hmm. Like I <laughs> like I hate begging, but like I, I got to humble myself a little bit because like, look, man, I can't do it without without support. Yeah. So like, please buy the game, buy some merch. Uh, I'm going to be up front. Like the merch doesn't give me as much money as buying the game because markup and like mm-hmm. print on demand stuff like that's just a little bit of a side sidetrack into the business side of things. Printing on demand is a little cheaper than like just buying like hundreds of uh, t-shirts that mobile buy might buy, mm-hmm. but it still costs me money and I only get like three or $4 a shirt. Yeah. yeah. The shirts are more for like advertising reasons. So please buy a shirt. Like, so tell people about my stuff, but like buy the game. Cause I get more money off of that. And the more copies of the game I sell, the quicker I'm going to be able to get the art and the layout and the editing and needed to make honest, this you're gonna official. And let's be honest, you're going to have more fun playing a game than wearing a shirt. Exactly. 
I don't know. My shirts look really good. I think you might have an equal amount of fun. <laughs> Let's play the game. Do <laughs> both. Like, do both. Do both. Like, I had a friend that did both. God bless him. He did it on his birthday, too. And oh. I feel bad about that because I didn't get him anything. <laughs> oh, <laughs> like, my, man, my man, Jamie, bought a shirt, bought the game. And I was like, oh, God bless you. Like, Number 30 bucks for me. Like, that was dope. Uh, but yeah, man, you know, that's, there's, that's what it is, what it is, man. I've got big dreams and a lot of people that are making the dreams in my circle. And like, I'm not trying to be jealous or anything. I just want to be in a position where I can help more folks. Oh yeah. You know? yeah that's absolutely. one of the things is like, it's not a finite resource. Like other people succeeding doesn't stop me from succeeding. So like, I definitely support people doing those cool things and like getting it. But like, I totally, I like, I want to be a part of it. <laughs> yeah. Just throw the money my way and I'll do what I can to help everyone. Yeah, yeah. exactly. You know? Totally. Totally. Well, well but that's my, that's my goal. Yeah. We get in the store. Like when my name gets big, all the other ships around me float too. You know yeah. what I'm saying? Right. Absolutely. Right. Well, Nick- join my fleet. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, Nick, thank you so much for joining us to talk about Tidebreaker. Um, can you remind everyone where they can find you online? At Follow My Blade on Twitter. You can also find me in the game at tidebreakerrpg.com. Like, you know, I spent a lot of money on getting that domain. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Might as well visit it. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, please visit the site. We put some work into that. And by we, I mean me, because it's just me at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> You know what I mean? So holla at me. I'm around. Join the Discord. Mm-hmm. The Discord links are anywhere attached to my social media or on the website. There you go. Well, thank you so much for Play sitting the game. down with Hang us. Out. Yes. <laughs> Play the game. Play the game. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much for sitting down with us. And thank you to everyone for tuning in. Thanks again, everyone, for joining us for our tiebreaker series. We had a lot of fun with this system and really went into some interesting places with our discussion. So I hope you enjoyed that. Uh, I just wanted to remind everyone to check out my A Tale of Twinkle and Awe uh, live stream again in about three weeks or so from the day this episode releases, uh, starting on January 8th, 2021. Uh, We'll be streaming every other Friday uh, from that point on until the story is done. Uh, For now, you can get caught up on our past streams. Uh, if you missed out, either at twitch.chimera.games or youtube.chimera.games. Uh, it is a lot of fun, and my cast is absolutely phenomenal, um, and I think you would really enjoy it. So definitely check that out uh, if you have a chance. Um, remember, we have next week off, so everyone, please enjoy your holidays safely. Uh, wear a mask, keep your distance, and uh, we'll be hopeful that 2021 will be a much better year than this one has been. Uh, we are a very, very grateful that you are spending your time with us here during these times. Uh, it really does mean the world to us. Uh, but if you do have time to spare for more podcasts, I really wanted to give a special uh, show blurbs shout out to the cast of A Horror Borealis, uh, which is also on this very network, uh, where they are playing through Stephen King's It uh, using Christine Previs's hack of Monster of the Week uh, back to Dairy. Uh this is a mini series uh, that they're titling "Losers: A Love Story." Uh, Losers is the the name of the group of kids uh, from the It franchise. If you're not familiar with it, um, and it's a love story. It's 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 a horror story, uh, but also it's it's focused around the relationships of these kids and uh, and them all grown up and coming back to Derry and trying to to end this menace once and for all um content warnings galore though uh it's extremely spooky at times um there is a lot of adult language every single episode um and some adult situations here and there um and my goodness a lot of a lot of potentially triggering content so please listen safely uh we do add content warnings at the beginning of every 
episode as well in the show notes. Uh, and we're starting to add timestamps to particularly troubling content. Um, so that way you can you can skip right over those if you uh, want to listen to something spooky, but not the, something uh, intensely spooky in some situations, perhaps. Now, I do happen to be the sound designer for this project, uh, so it would be fantastic if you could check it out uh, and hear that project brought to life. Um, and, you know, leave a review, maybe, uh, if you like what you hear. Um, or just or just let me know or, or let the, the cast of the show know uh, how they're doing or how you like it, because we we love hearing from you, uh, whether it's on Twitter or whether it's through an official review of sorts. <sighs> so I think that's enough of a side tangent for me uh, with this uh, fairly impromptu show blurb. Um, this is what happens when you leave me alone, Amelia. It's OK, but uh, take care, everyone. Keep making those amazing people and we'll see you next year. Character Creation Cast is a production of the One Shot Podcast Network and can be found online at www.charactercreationcast.com. Head to the website to get more information on our hosts, this show, and even our press kit. Character Creation Cast can also be found on Twitter at CreationCast or on our Discord server at discord.charactercreationcast.com. I'm one of your hosts, Ryan Bolter, and I can be found on Twitter at Lord Neptune or online at lordneptune.com. Our other host, Amelia Antrim, can be found on Twitter at Ginger Reckoning. Music for this episode is used with a Creative Commons license or with permission from the podcast they originated from. Further information can be found within the show notes. Our main theme music is Hero Remix by Steve Combs and is used with a Creative Commons license. This podcast is owned by us under Creative Commons. This episode was edited by Ryan Bolter. Further information for the game systems used and today's guests can be found in the show notes. If you'd like to leave us a rating or review, we have links to various review platforms out there, including Apple Podcasts, in our show notes. Also, check the show notes for links to our other projects. Thanks for joining us. And remember, we find that the best part of any role-playing game is character creation. So go out there and create some amazing people. We will see you next time. Now we got to read some show blurbs. Show blurbs. Show blurbs. Show blurbs. Show blurbs. Character Creation Cast is hosted by the One Shot Podcast Network. If you enjoyed our show, visit oneshotpodcast.com, where you'll find other great shows like Campaign. Campaign is an actual play podcast exploring lawn form role playing. The current campaign, Skyjacks, takes place in an original setting inspired by the music of the Decemberists, folk tales, and classic adventure fiction. Join Liz Anderson, John Patrick Cohen, Tyler Davis, Johnny O'Mara, and Game Master James D'Amato as they tell a tale of daring sky pirates. Also, it's basically an elaborate retelling of Weekend at Bernie's. Just search for Campaign or James D'Amato on iTunes, Google Play, or your favorite podcast app. E. All right. Ryan, I'm going to apologize in advance. My brother is here with his very barky chihuahua, who is oh. barking at my puppy, who is then barking back at said chihuahua. Also, my mom was like, I'm going to be vacuuming. Is that OK? And I was like, I guess. <laughs> OK, so I mean, I'll, I'll clean it up. It's fine. So like at least my children are at home. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's OK. <laughs> that's the best I can do for you. My kids and my loud that. dogs are home, so I also <laughs> yeah. apologize for similar reasons. Yeah, yeah there I, are four dogs and a mom vacuuming, so. Yeah. Uh, I don't I'm have in a sauna. Problem. Maybe yet. I don't so. know. But anyway. <laughs>
I'm okay. <laughs> we'll see. There's still time. <laughs> I'll make it work. I'll make it work. Yeah, so I was like, screw that. I'm going to make my own casino with blackjack and hookers, right? <laughs> yes. <laughs> I miss you. Please come back again. No, don't come oh, back again. Yeah. Let, let me just live in the nostalgia. <laughs> um, Absolutely. So what is um, what is unique about this game? Ryan, did I skip your question, or did did you do yours already? I did not. Oh, but, okay. Um, well, then you do your, or do you feel like we did that already? Well, let's cover it. Let's see what happens. Okay. Um, <laughs> let's so, see what happens. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> let's follow our outline. See where it goes. <laughs> Podcast to see what happens. I know. See what happens. That's fine. <laughs> oh gosh. <laughs> or can they see me? Is this going on YouTube? <laughs> uh, no, no. Oh. <laughs> But then they won't be able it's to an, see how much I'm smiling at all these jokes I and stuff. Know. It's, an, it's an untapped market, right? YouTube? <laughs> well, like, like us being on ago, YouTube. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. I mean, like, we totally could put these out, but then everyone would have to see all the times where I, like, get up because I left my glasses over there or, like, <laughs> go to my closet to get a sweater or... Edit it in post. <laughs> That's yep. what editing's for. I've got editing software now. I mean, maybe... Mm, maybe. This is like more work writer now. Tide Bray here gets this podcast to go on YouTube. Call it ahead of time. <laughs> <laughs> we'll be sure to credit you when we finally do. Please do. Yep. <laughs> I like free marketing. <laughs> <laughs> Heather, I want a face full of decisions for Christmas. <laughs> The girlfriend says cool. All right. So All right. We're, we're stealing that idea from you. Thank you. <laughs> um, um, but yeah, I forgot the question. Because um, I was like. <laughs> <laughs> it's evil Ryan that is always trying to get me to watch DBZ. So. Shout out to evil Ryan. Yeah. He's got good taste. <laughs> uh, at least he's not trying to get you to watch uh, TMNT. So. No, that's true. That's Jude. That's Jude. No, watch that too. Watch that too. Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. <laughs> oh no, no, yes. that's it. Shut it down. Show's over. We're not Sorry. talking about the Ninja Turtles here. Oh, I grew up with that. So here's the oh, thing. Funny. Here's the reason I hate them. My brothers oh, loved the Ninja Turtles. My brothers never let me do whatever they were doing, and everything. Like that, or I wouldn't get to do what I wanted to do because my brothers were doing their thing and there were two of them and one of me. So mm-hmm. it's, That's it so all kind of goes together. It's just a. I have happy memories of seeing this Ninja Tetra Turtles. Like, I like almost drowned in Atlanta when I was like nine. Oh, wow. And like uh, <laughs> my grandmother, bless her heart, <laughs> uh, she, she has this very like wry sense of humor where. I wake up in my hospital bed with a tub of water next to me and inside the tub of water is a Donatello action figure, but this one swims. Oh. <laughs> so she's like, that's what it looks like when you do it right. Oh, I'm no. Like, <laughs> <laughs> so I'm like, okay, I almost drowned, but I got a free action figure and it was <laughs> awesome. So wow. I was like, yeah, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Amazing. Right <laughs> that's awesome. I know we Shout had this one Ninja Turtle toy that like shot little tiny pizzas, and I liked that one. Mm-hmm. <laughs> that was fun. I remember That's that great. one fondly. Yeah. It's okay. I'm a, I'm a huge Piccolo fanboy. So, mm. like, Saiyans can suck it, though. No, I hate Saiyans. They're stupid and broken and make everything <laughs> bad. Um, yeah, so, like, all the Vegeta fanboys, fight me. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> uh, what is that? Yeah, you know, I should be like more familiar with actually guiding people through this process, considering I've done it like hundreds of times. <laughs> <laughs> That's only a mild exaggeration. I've had quite a few playtesters. Mm-hmm. Like, I'm pretty lucky in that regard. But no, nah, it's uh, like maybe like fifty, but still, mm-hmm. I've done like ten tables ish. Oh yeah, yeah. Uh, so I, I don't know by your metric if that's a large exaggeration or not, but it's, it's definitely an exaggeration of some extent. <laughs> It's in the ballpark. Yeah, we're in the ballpark. Half a hundred. Yeah. Gotta put an optimistic skin on it. Mm-hmm. Not spend, but skin, because this game is really about reskinning stuff mm-hmm. and then making it fit. 
All right, so let's go to character generation. No, I actually have the document open. I should have did that about 20 minutes ago. <laughs> I like that you lean into the mic for that part, too. Like, not only do you do the voice, <laughs> but you, like, get really close. I got to get close so I can see the record button, too. Because, like, if I'm here... I, I still have to tilt my head because it's way in the upper left hand. You don't corner. have to see it. You hover over it, and then when you say it, you click. I don't want to mess it up. I don't want to mess it up because, like, it's too me, high my, stakes. I know. <laughs> knowing me, my my hand will move just enough, and it'll be like two pixels off. Oh no! Yeah. And then we'll record the whole thing, and then we'll have to do it over because you won't notice. But you know, also I do it because uh, it's nice to lean in. Uh, get that nice little uh, extra ASMR. Get that vocal fry, that good. Get that vocal get fry. Get that good vocal fry. Clicky. Uh. <laughs> Whoa. Okay. That's a waveform. But before we get to that, we have... <coughs> a little bit of a cough. <laughs> Rice in my throat, apparently. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> Had Chinese food. Ooh, that actually sounds really good. Oh, it's so good, but no. <clears throat> I haven't had Chinese food in so long. Can't wait for all this to be in the outtakes. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> but first, uh, we have some Chinese food. <laughs> yep. <clears throat> huh. All right. Call to action. Just going to, like, trying to read this review real quick before I have to, like. Actually read it. Mess it up on air. <laughs> <laughs> Cooking up the peoples. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> so good. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> Ooh, let's hate on actual plays here, huh? <laughs> Did you see the Rollists podcast like commenting on uh Brendan Langambetta's post or yeah. whatever? And those like character creation sucks. It's the worst part of games. And I like I commented from our account and was like out. Rude. <laughs> <I know. laughs> what are you doing? <laughs> hey, now. <laughs> it, like, it only sucks because you've never had me on this show. <laughs> uh, we never had you on the show because apparently you think it sucks. So. I know. <laughs> no, they're really cool people. Um, I played, uh, what was it? Um, it's a, a, a game where you, what was it, Marie Kondo, the, the organization lady? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, it's a, I forget the name of the actual game, but it's a play on that. And it's all about you adventure um by uh trying to fit the proper items within your slots, your backpack. Oh. And you have to choose which items to keep and which items to discard on your adventure. But and only things then, that bring you joy. Yeah, and depending on how much space you have left, depending on what items you have, depending on all that sort of stuff, um, it it gives you uh, results of whether you survive or not, like your outcome. Oh, that's weird. Uh, it it was really interesting. Like we 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 beat the enemy. We we did perfect. We got the loot. We were on our way home, and my character fell off the cliff and died at the bottom. Uh, everybody else made it home safely. Those cliffs will uh, hit you but, every time. But but even though I died, I had a good outcome. Yeah. So, like, um, I was a paladin, I think, and I went, uh, I ascended to heaven as, like, a hero of the realm or something like that. Um, so it was, like, a good outcome for me, uh, even though I died. So it was just really interesting storytelling. That is, that's, God, games are so cool. I know. <laughs> games are so cool. <laughs> you caught my typo. <laughs> I'm a professional. <laughs> you are. Uh, I've been watching Saint Seiya like a lot recently too. Okay. It's kind of like yoga. He was kind of sort of hmm. And Pegasus was the, the dumb shonen uh, lead protagonist guy. Mm -hmm. It's just hot blooded and just like, but my friends. <laughs> <laughs> kind of dude. Yeah. Not really good at anything other than just being the hero. <laughs> <laughs> Ryan, remind me next time. Please cut this out because we're going to surprise everyone. I don't know what game we're doing next time. Oh, we're doing the one with Jeff. Um, but I feel like I need to make a himbo. Okay. Jeff Stormer? Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I got an interview with him in like two weeks. That's my homie. Nice. <laughs> oh, nice. 
Uh, yeah, it's gonna be fun. Yeah, I had a lot of fun last time he was on our show. I'm excited to like. Yeah, I'm gonna okay. shout you guys out like uh, when I'm on his show. Oh, very nice. It's like, hey, if you want to do like the character creation stuff that we did before this, yeah, like, look at this mm-hmm. podcast and we'll, we'll see us do it there. Awesome. <laughs> And now to play in one v one game, it was so <laughs> yes. fun. Man. I really want to go on it. party of one. And all that's being cut out. <laughs> uh huh. That movie was aggressively mediocre. Oh, was it? <laughs> oh, after all that, it was like so. I took my kids to see it, um, and was like, "Oh God, I can't believe I have to sit through this movie." And it was like, I sat through it, and I was like, "This was not as bad as I expected it to be, but it wasn't any better than I expected it to be." <laughs> it was fine. Like, would I be excited to watch it again? No. Would I hate mm. to watch it again? Also, no. It was <laughs> fine. Like, as far as movies for kids go, it could have been so much worse. Mm-hmm. I feel like Detective Pikachu was still better, but mm. it was fine. It was fine. That's my rating. <laughs> it's a solid, like, five out of ten. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> I am recording. Ooh, I, I had a little bit of a late click there, but um, I think it'll be fine. It's a very small uh, E at the end there, so <laughs> whatever. Gosh, that, that recording um, like drained me in such a good way. <laughs> like, I'm, I'm tired. Yeah. I feel you. Yeah. <laughs> but also, like, I slept until, te- like, I gotta go, like, play with my puppy and then my mom like right before we started texted me sos since i went running i was like what's wrong and she's like greg's coming wednesday instead of friday so we have to get the whole house cleaned and i was like greg (laughs) i'm like greg is my younger brother i'm like he doesn't he lives alone like it's him and his dog Mm -hmm. he doesn't care if the house is dusty no hardly anybody does my mom does then, while we were recording, she also texted a whole list of chores that need to get done. Mm-hmm. I but have never gone to somebody's house and, and said, wow, wow, look at all this so dust. Why are they mm-hmm. so... These people are horrible. Yeah, they're slobs. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It's horrible. Yeah. Oh, and then Dan and I had a whole fight about the kids' school today because he wants to send them back. Ugh. Oh. They sigh. <laughs> so really what I'm saying is I just want a nap, but I don't think I can. Yeah. Ugh. <laughs> well, that sucks. I know. Anyway, cold open, huh? All right, let's get this. How about that cold open? How about that cold open? (laughs) How about that episode thirty four point two? Yeah, that I haven't finished editing yet. Uh, I don't know. My my philosophy with twenty twenty is like, if it gets done eventually, that's great. That's I almost have to do it today though because I've got um, the next episode of Losers Love Story, um, and that that's like a. a love letter to sound design. <laughs> <laughs> it's so good. Um, and I, I've got to get that out by uh, Friday or so. Because I'm getting oh. paid for that work. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right, ready? Here we go. Five count. E. I am recording. Me too. Same, bro. Woo! Nailed it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Step one done. <laughs> like we're like halfway to being total professionals at this. I know, right? It's all you mm. have to do. Who you can find him at on Twitter. I believe it's Yaruki Zero. Let me double check. Because that was his uh that was his old name on uh his website. And clearly. Wow, I can't spell. Anyway, you can look him up later. Uh, but yeah, Aaron Clooney is cool. Yeah, and I, I'm I'm definitely cishet, but like I've I've got a little bit of <laughs> I mean, you know what I mean? Look, um, we're all we're all a little. You know. It's, it's a, a Kinsey like, scale. I, I, yeah, I was gonna say Kinsey scale. scale, dude. What's it's up? Scale. <laughs> like, yeah, it's definitely a scale. I'm like not ten points is straight. Probably like eight. You know what yeah. I mean? Not enough to bang a dude, but like enough to like be like, hey, you know that guy's handsome. Yeah, I like your beard, I mean, bro. That's what my friend <laughs> says. Like, yeah, I mean, I'm I'm pretty straight, but like we could talk about Obi Wan Kenobi. <laughs> For me, it's Vin Diesel. Mm. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, like a point or two lower. <laughs> <laughs> okay, back to the um, game. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, and we can hit stop. All right.
Word. Peace out. We did it. Nice.